So, uh, welcome everyone to this first panel room at uh, QD 2014. It's, it's nice to see so many people here. We've got Richard Wyden joining in the stage as well, so we must have given you quite a tough choice. Uh, so, I'm impressed that you chose us and hopefully we'll make it uh, worth your while. Um, so, I guess what we want to do over the next kind of hour or so is just look at the different ways that skeptics will engage with believers and just kind of explore which kind of tactics we can use, which ones work, which ones might not have uh, as much efficacy in places, and, and look at those kind of things really. Um, I'm sure as skeptics we've all been in that situation where we're having to engage and discuss with somebody who kind of disagrees with us about something, like a colleague at the water cooler who thinks that it was an inside job, or it might be a man who's absolutely sure that his copper for instance are helping with arthritis. Um, and it kind of presents us all with this opportunity to, to think, well, how exactly do we, do we go about it? Do we try and be kind of nice and hope to genuinely lead them to the truth, or do we try and be hard on and kind of give them the evidence and try and get them in, in that way? Um, you know, maybe we need to leave the horse to water and hope that it's thirsty rather than kind of force the feeding to drink. Um, so it's fair to say that across the panel we've probably got a range of different approaches and tactics that I think we all use in our kind of skeptical activities that we do. Um, so with that in mind, perhaps I'll start with Iran. Um, so uh, you've been a member, you've been president of the Australian Skeptics in the past for a number of years now. Uh, what sort of approaches to engaging believers have you found useful with, with your work there? So I think the um as an organization, the, the attitude you take to engaging with these is different to the attitude you take as a person. And I think it's very important to remember that um, these are two different things. As, as an organization, I think it's very important to remain um, respectful of the people you engage with. Um, you, you score no points at all by being anything but respectful. Even in our very public and very um, wild fights with the anti-vaccination brigade in Australia, we, we always make sure that we do not resort to um, uh, yelling and, and uh, swearing, which is, which is the kind of thing that you very, very often see in public forums, especially on the internet. So we generally, uh, even when we make a very strong point, um, even when we accuse people of uh, being um, frauds or, 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 or lying, we still do it in the, in, in the calmest possible way and in a way that does not uh, um, make us appear to the public as if we are at least shouting mm. uh, reasonable people. But I think even calling someone a fraud or, or a liar, which must be really nice to be able to do that without being sued, which is something yeah, so we don't get to do. So, so that, that's actually part of the, the thing. You don't actually say that they're frauds or that they're liars. So you, you insinuate um, and you make sure that you, or, or the best thing to do is actually to um, let them hang themselves, you know, so you ask them, you ask them the questions. And asking questions, by the way, is a good <coughs> idea. Instead of providing the answers, ask the questions and let the public, let the listeners or the, or the viewers make their own, uh, form their own opinion based on, based on the answers. Um, the, the thing is that um, you just have to remember that when you ask questions, people always often say, well, I was only asking questions. What appears to you as just cordial questions and just, just asking you know, and um, letting the other person say what their view is, very often to that person and sometimes to people around look like a huge attack. So, especially with, the, with very strongly held beliefs, just asking a question, just challenging that belief can be seen as a, as a very, um, very aggressive act. So well, I think it's a great place to bring Susan in because I know that uh, your work with Wikipedia has certainly challenged people's. Uh, beliefs and stories and things like that, and they've certainly felt that at times under attack. Uh, would, you fair to say that, would it be fair to say that your approach is maybe a little bit more sort of citation needed, uh, a bit more hardline skepticism than necessarily a, a general approach? Well, you know, I have several, you can hear me okay? Um, I have several different projects. So the Wikipedia project is just one of them. And I know we did have a very aggressive thing, the real skeptics on Wikipedia, we seem very militaristic and but we're actually very gentle. Uh, we abide by all the laws of uh, rules of Wikipedia. And when we engage somebody on Wikipedia itself in the talk pages, which are open for everybody to view, you can see it at any time you wouldn't have to be logged in or anything like that, we're very polite. Uh, we have to assume good faith. So if you take that attitude that somebody didn't put it up there maliciously, that they just uh, made the edit an error and they didn't really quite understand what they did, meaning to say, you just have to say, oh, well, you know, maybe you're not aware of the rules, but this is not how we do it. And I always try to explain to them. So if, it is, if you can find a citation that proves that the psychic 
is actually solved a, a missing child case, or if they've actually done anything that they've said, or you know they published uh, something, a premonition, or, you know whatever it's called beforehand, and then you know not after we approve that. I will gladly put it on the page. In fact, I will show you how. I will help you. And if you're polite to them, so that's Wikipedia. I've got lots of projects, and we have different approaches depending on how what, what we're talking about. But we'll get to that. Later. Yeah, and, and away from, from Wikipedia, I mean, how, how are the people who um, you're uh, examining and you're kind of correcting, I guess, <laughs> in a way, from want to better work, how are they engaging with that? How are they reacting to, to the work that you're doing? How does that kind of conversation work? Are you talking about the people who are like, moving maths and so on? Yeah, yeah, poly maths scientists, with, with uh, parapsychologists. Yeah. It's not parapsychologists. Okay, so we're talking about Sheldon, Sheldon, <laughs> right? Rupert Sheldrick and Deepak Chopra. Um, so if you guys aren't aware, I was uh, attacked pretty, pretty viciously by Rupert Sheldrick, who's the, uh, everybody knows who Rupert Sheldrick is, pretty much. Deepak Chopra's friend, their bed is going to hang out. What happened is that, um, let's see if I can do this in a little quick nutshell. Rupert Sheldrick, some people were advising him, saying, just like, just like he said, people think it's a war going on. There's some people on the talk page that were back and forth about a couple small things. And, and they thought, oh my gosh, this page is being rewritten. It's just being attacked on like this. So Rupert Sheldrick had bad advice. He had uh, people who did not understand the rules of Wikipedia telling him, you better go over there and you better do something. Your page is getting torn apart and blah, 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 on and on. So Rupert Sheldrick got all upset, didn't ask the right questions. If he had asked somebody like me, who would be very polite, they told him, because he is a human being. And I feel bad for somebody who is confused over the rules and things. And, what evidence means and things like that. So he came in and just like a bull in the china shop, just knocking everything over. And all he did was say, you guys are messing with my Wikipedia page. And everybody goes, hey, look at that Wikipedia page. Let's go look at that's wrong. Let's fix this. And all the editors of Wikipedia, no one on my team, descended on the page and twerked it and just cleaned it up. So what happened, Rupert Sheldrick has been blogging about me and um, his friends and his fans are all blogging about me. Deepak Chopra has, he won't name me, or be named to me, he spells my name. And um, it's just been really ugly. I mean, he's just blogged, and he, if you go to one of his lectures, some of my uh, my uh, editors went to a lecture with their children did in San Francisco, and they were sitting in the audience giggling because the guy just went on and on. Those skeptics, those skeptics. And so it's been a year now, and he's still on us. He's just, so I get all the time from people, young creationists, homeopaths, you guys, you're so evil, you're so mean, we won't let us edit Wikipedia, you know, why can't we put our stuff on there? Yeah, okay. Well, what's, what's really curious, what I'd like to bring Sam at this point, is that um, the, the reaction you've had from people on the other side, what is sort of funny by terms of science, has been that kind of visceral being attacked defensiveness. Now, Sam, when you've you engaged with people on the other side, you work with Camp Quest, and uh, you, you look very much open, you don't have that kind of um, defensiveness from, from people you're, you're working with. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, the nature of Camp Quest being a sort of uh, summer camp that attracts, like, probably younger versions of people in this room, you know, we, we don't tend to get a lot of, we definitely don't get a lot of religious people, but there are, there are people who have family members who use homeopathy, and alternative medicine is probably one of the bigger things that we deal with. Um, and, the, I mean, the nature of the camp is that the child can be very, very open and honest and respectful, because you have to be careful when you're dealing with children, you can't say, homeopathy is bullshit and anyone who thinks it is stupid um, because they're like, my dad, and, 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 you know, I mean, you have to take into account that, that children um, and young people. And you've had children who've actually been using homeopathy as a camp, haven't you? Um, yeah, I think that was more, sometimes more commonly we get children from uh, mixed families, so one of, <laughs> one of them would be That's a skeptic. That's a very tricky turn and I'm just going to use that one. One of them would be a skeptic and, and usually the child will come and they, quite often they say we haven't made up our minds and we say that's great, you're allowed not to know, you're allowed not to have an opinion on this. Because I think sometimes as skeptics we always want people who always want to have an opinion, want to know what their opinion is, want to change it and be right or wrong. 
and sometimes real life is a bit more gray, and there are plenty of things that I don't know well enough to have a strong opinion on. And I think maybe we underestimate the power of being just a bit open minded and, and open to evidence. And I think the openness is really, really interesting. It's also a very nice way of making sure that people aren't uh, you know, going to defensively. But on the flip side, has there ever been any cases where you think maybe I could have reached that kid a little bit more if I'd been a little bit more hardline or forthright or maybe not quite dogmatic or prescriptive, but in that kind of area of maybe because we let them make up their own mind, they've, they've walked away and I can recognize that they made the wrong decision or came to the wrong conclusion? Um, not really. I mean, you see this children on a sort of 24-hour basis for seven days, and there's really only so much effect and impact you can have in a small time. But I mean, when I think about personal beliefs that I've changed, it's, it's happened over a process of years. It's, it's never been something that I've read something on the internet where somebody said, this is wrong, and I've gone, oh, okay. You know, if you have a deeply held belief, it's something that maybe it just takes a moment, and then you'll think about it, and you'll come back to it. So it's a bit more of a slow process, and, and I, I think even if we don't take a really hard line approach to it, if we've just put a seed of, of doubt or a seed of curiosity, that is, that's our job done. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, from, from my side, I have to speak for, for a moment. Um, where, I, where I've been engaged with believers uh, and having those kind of conversations, um, I think I do try and take that very sort of gentle uh, question kind of approach that Ram was kind of talking about. And I know that we um, I have a podcast that I run with a very good friend of mine, David Stephen. Be reasonable, people might have listened to it, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I know that with um, that questioning approach, we've had a little bit of success, and we recently had a, a guy on uh, Jens Berg who's uh, on the, the, uh, the chair of the British uh, Medical Acupuncture Society. So we're very high up in how acupuncture is used on the NHS. And by having him on the show and just chatting, just asking very light questions, being, being very gentle and kind of almost giving enough rope, as it were. And by the end of the interview, he was basically, he, all, he literally admitted to me, well, the needles don't really matter in acupuncture, and the meridian line thing doesn't mean anything, and it can't really do anything. And by the end of the interview, he all but dispelled all the medical acupuncture, uh, despite being the, on the chair of it. I think by having that kind of really gentle, softly, softly kind of approach, you can sometimes lead someone either to come to a conclusion that they're really surprised at by the end, or by, uh, as Aran said, you kind of allow them to, not by hang themselves, but certainly uh, do themselves a, a disservice along the way. Um, well, I think what, what might be quite interesting, and it comes back to Shelby in a different way, it's almost, I guess, the, the law of unintended consequences. So, um, obviously, the work you were doing in, in correcting stuff that was on Shelby's Wikipedia was all by the book, completely as Wikipedia needs it. Um, but Shelby, because he's had bad advice, he's now out there writing blogs and doing TED Talks about how we skeptics are terrible people. Yeah, and I have to be clear, we weren't on Shelby's page, but that doesn't matter. I could have been. You know, yeah. it, I have every right to be there. My team has every right to be there, but we just hadn't gotten to it. You know, we, we do everybody else. We hadn't gotten to Sheldrake, but he was on the list. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but is, is it maybe um, being right in what we do? Is that necessarily enough, or do we then also need to, to then be nice about how we convey it and maybe sort of reach out to Sheldrake and, and dispel his myths rather than? I would, I would have happily have worked with him. We have worked with. Uh, people that are believers. In fact, when you're writing in Wikipedia, you are working with believers because they're there just as freely as we are to edit Wikipedia, but they have to abide by all the rules and um, they learn how to do the rules. But what happens is it's just they get very frustrated. I don't know if they don't understand necessarily the rules of evidence and they just, just get very upset and then they start blogging about things and saying, well, just give up. We've got many blogs from people who said they've just given up with editing Wikipedia because we can't win. I'm like, cool. Uh, you know, that's the win for us, but sorry. You know, you can't, they just don't get it, I guess. I don't know. And, and I feel very bad. I really did feel very bad for the children because you have no control of your Wikipedia page. Mm. And that is your reputation. To have a Wikipedia page, you know, to be honest, that is important. That is everything. It's people are going to go to your Wikipedia page before they go to your website. So to have no control, no control whatsoever over your Wikipedia page must have been extremely frustrating for him. And I can imagine that would have been that he's just uh, being advised by the wrong people and they didn't know what the heck they were talking about. It's just very sad. Well, thank you. I'd like to come back to Dr. Ron. You want to say something there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to point out one of the things about Wikipedia is that the rules of Wikipedia. <coughs> By um, Stephen Miller. So, um, uh, Jimmy Wales actually admits that it's 
some of these things, some of the rules were actually taken from uh, science-based medicine parts. So I think for people who are not as well embedded in, in what skepticism means as, as we are, it, it would be quite difficult to understand the, the, the rules are different to the rules that we used to play um, um, in your daily life. Um, so I understand that. I understand that frustration. Yeah. Is it our job to, to make people understand the gap between those rules, or is it kind of it got to it depends, so, it depends, so, really so I think it depends, it depends who. So I, I, I alluded to that earlier that you know, there's the what you do as an organization, and then there's what you do as a person, and also what you, what you do as a person. There's, there's, um, it's not, uh, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one situation, you know, like a friend of my, um, my sister is who believes in ghosts, and he's really keen to convince me Exist. And the conversation can go in one way, and then there's conversations that are um, done in public uh, with other people observing. Um, those um, also may have a different um, uh, color to them, different, different way that they progress. And a lot of it is to do with what you're trying to achieve. So uh, I'll refer to the public situation. There could be a, a situation in public where you actually want to convince, you want to convince that person um, that you're right. Um, in that case, um, you would behave differently than if you, what you're trying to do is you're playing for the, for the people who are watching uh, or listening to the conversation. Um, generally, um, uh, when, when there are other people listening, um, you can, I think you can be a lot harder, you can be a lot harsher on the person you're debating with. Um, because, um, again, you have to always appear um, to be respectful of the person, but not their opinions necessarily. And I think that's a, that's a really important thing. You, you can smack down the opinions, but do not smack down the person. Is there a flip side of that? That um, whether people listening, you don't want to be harder or harsher because you come across looking like the hard, harsh person who the person you're talking to then seems very not quite victimised, but certainly with a little power status in the conversation. Um, I don't, I don't find that that's the case. Just remember again, if you're, if, if for example, you're um, uh, what's your name, uh, the real life science guy, and you have mm -hmm. not you have an audience full of creations, then, then that's obviously a different situation. And if you feel that the, the people outside of the conversation are people who are open to listening to what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. In which case, the important thing is not what happens between you and the person that you're debating with, but what, <laughs> is, what the message is that you're able to convey. Yeah. That interaction is not very important. That, that, in, that interaction is the vehicle by which you convey the message, the evidence, the, 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 the weakness in the evidence on the other side. So I think, I think in that respect, in those situations, it doesn't really matter what happens between, between you two and whether you're happy with each other or, or whether you, you know, the other person feels insulted or, or, or uh, comes to believe uh, that your evidence is wrong. What's important is what other people hear and think. But, you know, we have, uh, Sam actually said something really important earlier. There's a huge amount of evidence now that um, what works and what doesn't work in, in these kind of debates. And if you start um, um, with, with a true belief, if you start by, try by attacking them, what you're doing is, again, a lot of evidence for it, what you're doing is you're reinforcing them. You're actually making them believe their opinions more strongly. You're reducing the chance that they'll change their minds. That's sure it's come down. It's sure it's come down. <laughs> so, so generally, if you're trying to convince someone who's already a true believer, and that's generally a terrible approach, the approach should be seek. You know, just plan to see in their mind, or just, just expose them to information, and maybe it will have some effect sometime down the line. Um, but again, if you're playing for, you know, you're arguing with the true believer, but you're really playing for the audience, you're playing for the, for those who are not convinced, they just want to know what's true or not, then the rules are completely different. And then I think you, you can make your opinions much more strongly. Speaking of playing for an audience, I think it's probably a good opportunity to take a, a question from the audience. So does anyone have anything you want to uh, ask at this point? We do have a roving microphone, orange shirt, a volunteer who will be coming around. Um, so there's a hand up uh, just there which happened at the bubble, uh, and then there's a one on the front row. <coughs> That's one of my editors. Oh, I see. This will be a softball <laughs> question for you. Yeah. Uh, this no, 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 no. How do I get there on the screen? No, He's one of my editors. Close to Close you your mouth. We're happy to what? Close your mouth. Yeah. You said you're happy to work with Sheldrake or you know whatever. And I'm, I'm curious beyond like the correct spelling of his name and maybe his date of birth, where where you would work with, be able to work with him on anything. Well, we worked yeah. on we worked on uh, cryptozoologist's page. 
age, um, a man who was very, um, should I say it, he was very frustrated by the way he was being represented, and it was very, it was, it was harming his health. He was very stressed. And uh, a friend of mine who does Monster Talk uh, found, they had talked to him about it, and the man was very, you know, we had good criticism on this page, but we, we talked to him about it, and we said, look, these are all the facts, but we really were very nice about it. It's very factual, but we were just, you know, we worked with him, and we explained the procedures, we went through it, and he was, like, so relieved, because I guess they had put things on there that were just really ugly and awful. So with sheltering, if he had, let's say he had called me up or whatever, um, I got to have my phone number, let's say he wrote to me, I would probably have gone through, first I would have apologized for how confusing the rules are and how frustrating it must be for somebody like that. I know I would have done that. And then I would have gone through and said, okay, well, what are the problems? What is it just seeing that's a serious problem? And then I would have said, well, that is, you know, you can't make these statements in public and not expect us to put them on the page, you know, because I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. I would, and I would, I would explain it as I went through it. And if he wanted to have a better photo of himself, he could, I'd be happy to put it up there. You know, he uploads it for me, so I could give him a nice photo. <laughs> <laughs> But I think there's also opportunity to work with you that uh, not just about <coughs> getting his page correct or, or, or having him understand how his page is correct, but maybe even understanding a little bit about what these skeptics are trying to do. I mean, for, for the audience's uh, information, I guess, we were actually really keen to have Rupert come along and be on the parapsychology panel, because um, I thought it would be a really nice opportunity for, to, to invite a guy who's going around on a TED talk saying that Milton skeptics are trying to silence him to come here and tell us exactly how they're silencing him. So explain to us how they're censoring him. It's a stage, here's a microphone, tell us how they're censoring you, please. Uh, so I think it'd be really nice to have the opportunity of saying, well, this is actually what we believe, and if you can sort of point out where we're wrong and then show us how we're wrong, then we're, we're willing to listen for you. Um, do we have a another question at the front here, I think, first? Yeah. Hello. Um, so the discussion has been more about sort of face-to-face -face interaction with people. Um, so my question was about, um, so me and, like, for example, me and Marsh, we've been on, for want of a better word, underhand, Investigation. <laughs> 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 we're using different names, we've got nasal illnesses, etc. And I just wonder what people thought about the efficacy and perhaps the ethics of that sort of approach to issues. Uh, yeah, so are we, are we um, being mean to believers by lying about our names and uh, telling the stories about our parents who aren't actually as ill as we're pretending? Um, personally, when I go into cover it in those kind of ways, I don't think, it's, I don't think the, the ethics are all that muddy. Um, because I don't think I'm saying anything that somebody wouldn't say to them in that situation. Um, there are people whose parents are frequently going to call the barracks and tell them about these awful headaches my mum's been getting, migraines three or four times a week for the past two months, that uh, leave her knocked out, vomiting all sorts. Um, there are people who have that kind of that kind of symptom, <coughs> and Holland and Barrett's often be homeopathy to cure those symptoms. Now if you've got those symptoms, see a doctor, it could be a brain tumor, it could be something crazy. Um, so for me, I, I don't think ethically there's a, there's a grey area there because if somebody did have those symptoms and asked those questions, um, that's the answer all the barriers would give them. It just happens that the, the, the situation isn't true, but it, it could be true for someone else. Um, there are times I do actually feel a bit, a bit bad. There are a couple of people who I want to, uh, who you'll know who I'm talking about in particular, who are very, very lovely people. And when you're sat uh, in a two-hour conversation with someone who doesn't know your real name and is telling you exactly why they believe in this therapy, how it helped them when their dad was very ill, you do start to feel a little bad that they're calling you John, and you're not called John, and there's nothing in the <laughs> You do start to, you want them, and, and I think maybe warming to, warming to people of a different um, mindset and, and that level of compassion for someone who just happens to have wrong ideas is kind of the key to, to the stuff that I kind of do. I don't know if anyone else has any other take on that. I think you have to be practical about these things as well. Sometimes if you don't, um, lies probably just from the word, but at least hide your, who you are, you won't get the access to the things. When I go to psychics, for example, which don't do, don't do that often, but when I do go to psychics, I make a point of not saying my name, obviously with my name, you know, the Google, they'll find me, they won't find somebody else, they'll just find me, so I, I want to make sure that I give them the best chance they have to actually be psychic, but so far it's, it's I don't know. No, no, <laughs> for them, for me it's important to find, but for them it's not very well. Um, but if I actually say what my name is, then that's gone, then that, that opportunity to have a psychic reading, a psychic reading is gone. So I think we have to be practical about those things. We can't uh, sometimes get to places, get places if we say who we are. 
And before we take another question from the audience, I just, there was one other thing I wanted the panel to consider, really. Um, so does our approach depend on, as much as we can tell, the intentionality of the person we're speaking to? So do we uh, react differently to someone who is uh, mistaken, deluded, genuinely believed, to someone that we could tell was lying? It's very, very difficult to tell someone someone's lying, but we've maybe been in situations, I've certainly been in situations where you caught a side account, you've just seen them, you, you saw them check the notes, they're definitely just cheated. Do we change our approach? And then before you, you answer this one point that I'd like to make on that, if I may, uh, to sort of help frame why, why I'm asking the question. So a couple of years ago, uh, myself and Haley did an interview with um, a guy called Jim Humble, who gives um, uh, mineral, a mineral, <coughs> mineral solution, a whole industrial breach to people who have cancer, AIDS, malaria, all sorts of stuff. And we got an interview with the guy. The Guardian couldn't get an interview. He turned down the BBC. But we managed to get an interview. God knows how. And speaking to him, he was saying he's treated 50,000, 60,000 people uh, with cancer and malaria all across the developing world, all over the place. Um, and I genuinely think he believes he was doing good, but if he's even exaggerating by tenfold, there's 5,000, 6,000 people, he may have the blood on his hands of 100, 200, 300 people's deaths, uh, which is a very odd thing to be in a conversation with someone. Now, the intentionality behind those deaths doesn't matter to the power of the corpses. Uh, so do we need to change, do we change our approach depending on whether someone believes or don't believe, or does it agree with them or not? No, I, I think it absolutely does, does matter. Because if I have Meryl Dory with me on the stage, or in a, on, I will do my best to demolish them. Meryl Dory is the head of the Australian vaccination. This December, actually, you know, now they're called, now they're called Australian, Australian Vaccination Skeptics Network. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it does depend, too. If you have a psychic that is, you know, we know that they are doing something and that they don't really believe what they're doing. You know, this is not the kind of the, the whoosh uh, woman with the, oh, you know, she's married, or whatever. It's sweet, you know, but the kind, you know, like, I can't mention the names um, here, but the, you know who I'm talking about, the kind of the TV ones and things. Heck yeah, we'll go right after them, you know, protest them. We've, uh, Mark Edward and I and some other people, we've done some protests and things and all kinds of stuff. Because you're not trying to get at the believer. At this point, there's no way you can convince the believer. You have an audience of people. What we want to do is we want to rattle the psychic mm -hmm. and the managers and the team. And if you can rattle them, because they're performers, this is what Mark always says, Mark Edward says, is they're performers. And if you can rattle them, then the performance is going to go down and they're going to think twice about that. They're going back to that area again. So while I'm kind and gentle in a lot of places, when it comes to something like, you know, these people who we call them grief vampires, who prey on people who have children that are missing and so on, ew, get them. Just <laughs> take, them, take them down. I think you can say it for, for pretty much certain that uh, Sally Morgan doesn't use any of these in her readings, uh, in the anymore? show she's doing. Well, we can't even say she doesn't use one. We can't say it anymore. We don't actually think. But certainly, yeah, the, the reading she's doing on her shows at the moment, um, I can say categorically she's not using an earpiece uh, for, for whatever reason she decided to abandon that. Um, <laughs> I would like Susan just really quickly to mention Mr. Rail and what happened with that. Mr. Rail. You know, from Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. Jimmy oh, Rail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 Mr. Rail. Is he a psychic? What is that? The weirdest Roger Hardy. Yeah, Jimmy Wells, you guys all know about, uh, he just came out with, uh, the founder of Wikipedia just released, uh, there was a change.org petition that um, the, you guys are ready, that the uh, uh, believers had put out. I think they would believe in, uh, not therapeutic touch, it was uh, talk therapy. And it's, it has something to do with vibrations from your fingers and things like that. Um, yeah, three. Which one? Yeah, three. Yeah, okay, that's right, yeah. I hadn't heard of it before until I read the Wikipedia page. But they had, a, anyway, so they had asked Change.org to please, to an open letter to Jimmy Wells, the founder of Wikipedia, to please allow us to put our stuff on there because we want to help people. There's a lot of people that we could be helping with our therapy, but people, is, Wikipedia is so popular and, and people aren't going to our therapies because he's like, you've got to be kidding. So he posted that. Anybody not see that? It's just hilarious because it's maybe like a paragraph or two that Jimmy Wells is like, uh, -uh no, I don't think so. Wikipedia has rules, and we have re rules for a reason, 
And as soon as you start giving us some evidence, you can call some charlatans, and they're just like, oh my god, this is so great. And then people are congratulating me, and I'm like, no, 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 I don't have anything to do with this. Jimmy Wells is not aware of my project that I know of. And they're like, oh, he says that's great job, great job. You guys keep hammering on with me. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what do you say? Yeah. You know, it's hilarious. But I must admit, I, I read that, and you know, my first response was, oh, great, that's fantastic to see someone being so, so open and kind of uh, and clear in the media. And then my second thought was, oh, those kind of poor EFT guys. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> they genuinely want to help people. They, did, they just pull really the out that they're doing doesn't help. Because they um, really feel, they, there's a lot of people who really, really believe that they, you know, they, what they do is real. It yeah. is. I, I go back to one, that they're so delusional and we can't reason. But, but I wonder how much, how many people reading that response and would skeptics read that response and think, great, and skepticism that I do, that I do is really valuable, and there's other people doing it, and you can be impassioned and uh, energized and want to do more stuff. But then I think the believers who read that response think, okay, well, Wikipedia isn't for me, Wikipedia is off, off hands, I'm not allowed in there, I've been kicked out of there, and then they feel excluded. So I wonder whether we're just polarizing even further. Whereas if, if Jimmy had kind of said, hey, well, actually, you welcome put stuff on there, but you have to evidence it this way because we need to be sure that other people who are lying can't get on there. So how are you going to be able to do that and work with them a little bit? Probably should. Yeah, they have the same response, but maybe we would be going around with that. Uh, okay. right. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was great. But I think the, the issue is that most people will not be reading what Jimmy Wells wrote and will not care about what is it is. Most people just, they need to know something about something and they go on Wikipedia and they, whatever is on Wikipedia is the absolute truth because it's it's like the old black on, you know, yeah. black on white kind of thing. Uh, Sam, so you mentioned something to me last night when we were chatting about um, how difficult it is to change people's minds and how uh, people stay entrenched. Do you want to sort of maybe comment on that? I think that fits quite neatly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the last statistic I read was something like one of the five people stay with the religion that they're born into or baptized into or whatever, which means that sort of 80% of the people don't change their mind about how they find them Obviously, the one in five people who do includes people who were sort of born Church of England and became a non-believer. So it's actually a very small minority of people who I suppose have the capacity to change their mind, and I'm not one of them personally because I'm saying non-religion that I was born into. So you know, I can't even make that. Yeah, you guys are right, so that's why you're. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great to be right? Um, but you know, I, I think, um, and especially with something like alternative medicine. Alternative medicine are not just doing it because generally they're doing it because they have health problems that the medical professionals actually aren't taking seriously or can't figure out the problem to. Um, so, for example, my mum and I both suffered from celiac disease, and um, she only found out after I was diagnosed. And she's been to so many doctors over the years, and um, when I was young, she went to naturopaths, she went to homeopaths, um, she tried all the things in the clinic of Barrett. Yeah, and, and nothing worked, but it wasn't because she was really passionate about alternative medicine, it's because no one was actually giving her answers or taking it seriously. And I think that may be one thing where it's, it's kind of biased towards women in a certain respect because, well, for example, if you go to the doctor with a stomach complaint and you're a woman in your 40s, 50s, they say, oh, well, it's obvious so much women are like that. And, you know, it could be bowel cancer and they just send you away. They, they've shut you down, and that's that face of the medical establishment is your interaction with your GPs. And you go to the alternative medicine and they go, what's wrong? Mm. And that's really wrong. And that is so powerful. How's it in your That is so powerful. The effects of stress of just talking to someone for half an hour can really make a difference. But you know they still send you home with a bowel cancer. Yeah. Yes, it feels like that. You feel something better about it, yeah. And you feel you feel more positive towards the person who's listening to you rather than the person who might be right that you do have IBS, but it's to shut you down. And so when you get these repeated interactions with doctors like that, and I know, and I really suffer from this at the moment, I actually don't trust doctors, not because I don't trust science, but because I am terrified that they will dismiss what I'm going to the doctor with. Yeah, you have your experience of being reinforced. Yeah. I just happen to not trust the alternative medicine practitioners. <laughs> but, but I guess it kind of speaks to a, an important issue, I suppose, that uh, many people, when we're talking about believers, and I always try and use uh, scare quotes when I say believers, because it feels like I'm kind of labelling a them and us, and we're you know, an intellectual apartheid or something that I don't think we should be part of. But when we are speaking to people who do believe things that we, we disagree with, 
It can be very hard to bear in mind that they've come to those, those beliefs, often sometimes through, through desperation. Um, and I think <coughs> at a moment of desperation, we're all susceptible to something. And we're just fortunate that we just don't have to be in that moment of desperation where, where you know, our, our price is met or our buttons are pushed enough. So it's kind of our responsibility to have that additional compassion to reach out to people who are in that time of need, uh, lest we be in that time of need and no one reach out to us, I guess. I think that's particularly true um, when people are in agreement positions. You know, they're obviously extremely vulnerable and they, they're looking for anything. Um, and unfortunately, skepticism can't provide you with a warm, fuzzy feeling of at least blah, blah, blah. Um, <coughs> so yeah, there isn't like really an alternative to going towards, you know, contacting psychics and spirit mediums or whatever, because there isn't really the skeptical choice to deal with the grief, just sort of get it. It hurts. Yeah, it's yeah. painful. Well, um, I just recently finished all my cancer treatment. I had breast cancer. And this is a really good point, because when you go into nature and for the first time, they, they sit you down and they don't know me. They have no idea what my background is or anything like that. I'm a woman with breast cancer. That's all I know is even 50 years old. Whatever. And he was just kind of fishing. You could kind of tell. He didn't know if I was going to be one of those people who comes in and says, I'm not doing this, you know, I'm going to go into homeopathy or whatever. I'm going to go have, you know, he didn't have any clue. So he's kind of fishing around which kind of person am I? Am I the type that's going to follow his instructions? Am I the type that's going to um, look for alternatives? He didn't know. And my son was in there and he uh, um, offered me acupuncture for pain and so I just was kind of I kind of paused and I asked another question and then I stopped and I said no wait we gotta go back to that are you this is you're a, a you're an oncologist I mean you're a man of science why are you offering me acupuncture so he's like oh well you know oh you need to backtrack a little bit and my son and I just argued about that for for a longest time because to some people who are coming for treatments you don't want to scare them away you don't want them to leave. So you might want to offer something like that, homeopathy. Oh yes, you can still do your homeopathy, but you need to come to your treatments. So it's kind of this thin line. You don't know what to do, you know, because I was just like, what? You know, you're supposed to be treating me. You believe in this? Well, well, well there's some benefits. I mean, the insurance pays for it, so it must be had some kind of as they told me. And then when I went for my follow-up just after I've all done, and my senior nurse, the that I've been through all this treatment with, she told me, oh, I just came from a medium. She had gone to a psychic, and my jaw dropped. And I said, what? You're kidding me? Seriously? Really? Oh, come on now. For fun? And she said, oh, you're just like, so it depends. Like he said, it depends who you're talking to. This is a friend of yours or whatever. You're like, no, really? You know, come on. You're joking, right? She goes, oh, I just want to see what you have to say. And then there's a question in the audience at the front here, uh, then we'll take uh, another one that I'll let Anne uh, choose, which one we take next. Oh, sorry, the front. Oh, it's a dude. <laughs> okay, um, I think I have a question, and it's very nice to build up to what I was talking about. I have a colleague who is, I uh, was just going to on radio, keep therapy and radio therapy for breast cancer, and she also takes homeopathy. And we were talking about it, and it's, we obviously want to go softly, softly, but in this situation, I didn't feel I wanted to tackle it at all because it would be horrible because she was going through such a terrible thing. Um, so I didn't tell her that it was bunker. Um, but I felt like I should, but I didn't want to make her feel bad because she is not in a good place. Um, so I don't know how to tackle that now because I want to tell her that it's You need to pick your battles. You really do. And that's when, when it comes all down to it, and uh, there's a very smart podcast out there that I just love. His name is Brian Dunning. It's a skeptic podcast, skeptoid podcast. He says, pick your battles because you don't want to attack anybody over their belief in ghosts or whatever because you want them to feel like they're going to, when they have a question, that they can come back to you and you're not going to judge them and you're not going to attack them. So you need to find uh, a common ground. That's what Brian Denny says. He says, you know, so in the case of the woman with uh, homeopathy, I would, I would say, Try to find something that she really doesn't believe in and you don't believe in, you know, some kind of medicine. You say, well, what do you think of, I don't know, vitamin C pills? <coughs> we heard him skeptic camp uh, yesterday. And she'd say, oh, that's a bunch of baloney. And I'd be like, yeah, you 
you know, and you start talking about what evidence means, and you start talking about things, and in a roundabout way, we can get to homeopathy. But for somebody who's going through um, anything like what I just went through, I would definitely not, you know, explain it to them. I'd say, you know, what does your doctor think about that? That's what I would say. What does your doctor think about that? And I'm pretty sure the doctor is probably going to say, you know, let them do it as long as they come to the treatments. I don't really care. I think that's absolutely the key. Exactly what I was going to say, really. It's just to say, well, you know, so long as you're keeping up the chemotherapy, I'm sure this kind of thing can't harm. But I've heard people who give up the chemotherapy and it doesn't work well. Yes. So to be sure to have the two. Yeah. What did your doctor say? That's what I'm afraid of, is if she was going to stop her treatment. Then you have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's any suspicion that she might harm herself, homeopathy, the only harm of homeopathy can cause directly is if you drown. So, so I think it's very important to. Standards Authority 
change the rules so that you could reform websites for making misleading claims. They had a very small number of uh, homeopaths protesting outside their head offices, feeling like they're being attacked, that they're being silenced by this, uh, this big conglomerate that is the ASA. Uh, totally misunderstanding everything, obviously, because they're homeopaths, that's kind of what they do, that's their modus operandi. Um, but when you talk to the politicians, they're very reluctant to get into it. Um, and I think that's, again, that might be the failing uh, of us as skeptics, or not necessarily failing that's frame or positive. That's an opportunity for us as skeptics to be a bit more vocal when it comes to politicians, to, to represent our view. Because when the homeopathic hospital that existed, that was a real thing, you know, there was still them around there, but the one, one, the one in Liverpool, on my doorstep, uh, that one, um, when that was under threat, it wasn't the skeptics that the, uh, the politicians heard from, it was all the people who went there. And they had everybody who went and had their iscadol treatment, which is made from mistletoe and isn't being homeopathic, but fuck it, the, the homeopaths would take that. Any, anything's a win, so long as you get bodies in front of the, uh, the, the politicians saying, please don't take my cancer treatment away. Um, that's incredibly persuasive. Why, you know, why would, would a politician follow the evidence when they have the votes to win? So I think we need to be a bit more visible and a bit more vocal in, in counteracting stuff and supporting the, the cause we're going to vote with. You know, email your politicians and write to them when they've done something good. Uh, and writing when they've done something bad, um, rather than necessarily yeah, just kind of uh, touching about it in the pub. I think it's really important that we become a bit more, more prominent and more, more visible. I think one thing with regards to political campaigning is that uh, uh, politicians are very sensitive to letters, but people don't realise how, <coughs> if they receive a hundred letters, not formal letters, formal letters are different, but if they receive a hundred personal letters about supporting a specific position, that's a lot. That's a lot for any politician. De definitely in Australia, 100 would be very high number. So, um, approach them directly with your, with your point of view rather than public campaigning. And if they receive lots of letters, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, so, we have a comment from our rolling microphone now. Yes, you, you worked so hard, I shall let you speak. <laughs> just just uh, comment. I would expand that up to a European level what you were just talking about. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, I see many people from um, different countries all over the world, and uh, Europe as well. So we should be more visible at the European level. Uh, and of course, worldwide too, but uh, we are here in Europe. Uh, and because there are policies being made in the Euro European Union as well, and we should be have our voices heard and we could do that in a way uh, that we can organize ourselves into larger groups uh, that are capable of lobbying. So, yeah. thank you. I'm going to do an organization, EXO, which, uh, which is looking to do exactly that. Because um, there's a very, a very interesting case with the uh, homeopaths in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands rather, um, when there were legislations that were to try and make you uh, demonstrate the efficacy of the product before you sold it. This was an EU legislation going to be put in, and homeopaths were up in arms. <laughs> and in the, in the Netherlands, they, they uh, actually successfully lobbied to say, you can't make us prove that our homeopathy works because homeopathy is quite a big export industry in the Netherlands and you're going to really hit us economically. So you have to let us sell stuff that we don't have to prove works, otherwise you are, we're going to sort of decry that you're taking away our right to earn. And they were successful because they campaigned and, and we didn't. Uh, they kind of won, so I think that, that's certainly a great, a great point. Um, so I guess just to, just to wrap up, I'm going to come to one last thing. I'll play a little bit of devil's advocacy and see what the panel thinks. Um, we play it nice and gentle to, to believe that we meet halfway, um, but when we do that, is that us being compassionate, compassionate and sensitive to our fellow man? Or are we just kidding ourselves? Is it just positive PR? We want skepticism to be seen quite nicely, we want people to think of the skeptics as quite nice people. Um, are we doing it or are we, are, we, are we kind of kidding ourselves by, by playing nice? Or should we be? Should we be beating over the head of evidence? Well, I don't really consider myself like, probably going to get ambushed for this, but as, as part of the skeptic community, maybe these guys are because I feel like I do one thing and then I'm more of an individual or something. Um, so I guess you could say it's personal positive PM, like you know, a little bit dick. Um, but on the whole, I feel like, you know, that could easily have been like your point earlier. Uh, we're all vulnerable in different ways at different points in our lives, and, um, you know, I'm not better because I don't believe in something. Um, and this is, I think that's just the, kind of my personality. I just, I, I try not to cause conflict and, and, and ridicule them and ask people because I just think it's very nice. Is that right? So I think on a personal level, I think you should be comfortable. It's controversial. <laughs> controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, more importantly, it's about, I don't think it matters whether you are 
mechanism that we are not forcing one who is what he loves on. If your goal is achieved by being nice, then be nice. And if your goal is achieved by not being nice, then don't be nice. So I think that's what we got. Again, on a personal level, my inclination is generally not to uh, get into a fist fight, unless it's an elderly. Are you calling her out? Right here. Yeah. <laughs> or or look. So, but um, I think otherwise it doesn't mean See you. Um, I think that it's, I like to use the Wikipedia rules of just being, you know, having backs in line and uh, be nice about it because you don't know who the person is who you may, they may become your biggest supporter uh, <coughs> and once they kind of understand. And just because a homeopath is, is trying to get onto the homeopathy page doesn't mean that they might not become my supporter when we're trying to work on a side page or something like that because they have their areas that they're maybe blinded to. And as I said, most of us are and we're believers. We come from that kind of background. I think that we just need to be nice. Um, I think in the skeptic world ourselves, the world is too small. We are just too small of a group to be infighting and messing with each other. I just really feel that um, if there's a problem, we should talk to them and you know call them up or whatever you do nowadays. I don't know. But, um, and if we have a problem with the uh, Rupert Sheldrick, I would have been, like I said, I would have been just fine with him approaching me, and, and I've had other people approach me, but they don't seem to have the rules of engagement, right? I had an astrologer who was like, I want to debate you. I'm like, why? What, what? You know, so they just, they, they think we're so mean that they that we wouldn't even talk to them, but I don't have a problem talking to them, and I talk to them all the time. Excellent. I think on that group hug note, uh, <laughs> we end uh, this panel. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panel. Sorry.